Welcome back to another episode of the Vendetta Sports Fantasy Show. We've got another two-man crew. It is September 18th. We are recording this in the evening. We have myself, Scott Logish, and Anthony. Anthony, how you doing? Uh, not too bad. Pretty good week so far. Good to hear. So, doing this mainly as a follow-up to the Thursday night game, but first let's get into some news. Uh, CJ Uzama, starting tight end for the Cincinnati Bengals, is out for the season with a torn Achilles. Who does this impact more? Who does this have the biggest impact on the Bengals roster? Well, I would say if AJ Green can stay healthy from here on out, I would think he would see a big bulk in production. Also, Joe Burrow, he does love throwing to the tight end, but no Zama, that's a, that's a big blow to him. I would like to see them get Joe Mixon a little more involved now. If, you know, you don't get your top top tight end threat, might as well try to run the ball as much as you can. One of the things, A.J. Green hasn't been the receiver he used to be upon returning from missing the entire season last year and half of the previous year due to injury. And with the Bengals, they gave Joe Mixon that massive contract, but they're not doing a great job at justifying it. When you pay a player like that, at times, you want to have to prove yourself right. You want them to play extremely well. You want them to be able to produce so you can see, look, we made the right decision here. Now, Joe Burrow, he has been doing amazingly. He's been doing much better than I thought he would because he almost single-handedly won them this game against the Browns. Like, the Browns only won by five points, and they have the much better roster on paper. 100%. I mean, even watching that game last night, it just seemed like – that Bengals offensive line just could not block for Mixon. But on the flip side, you got Giovanni Bernard in there at the goal line. Uh, they ended up not scoring the touchdown on that. It got called back, and then Joe Burrow took a bad sack on uh, second down, I believe, turned it into a third and 20. So they basically were just out of uh, getting the touchdown at that point. But, you know, I don't understand. You're, you're paying Joe Mixon all this money. Shouldn't he be your absolute bell cow, even on the goal line? Absolutely. Like, if you are paying any player a large sum of money, you're an idiot if you don't involve them heavily in the offense. If you're paying a receiver a lot of money, you better get them involved in the offense. They better produce. If you're paying your quarterback a lot of money, he better produce. If you're paying your tight end a lot of money. You have to find a way to make them produce and have them justify that type of contract. With Joe Mixon, I don't know if it's an issue of the way Zach Taylor is distributing snaps. I don't know if it's an issue with Mixon himself. But so far, he's not looking like he's worth that big contract. No, not at all. He rushed for under 50 yards in both first two uh, games. Uh, it's really not looking too great for him, but see what happens next week. Yes, we will. Getting a bit of a preview of this weekend. A.J. Brown is out for, their, for the Titans game against the Jacksonville Jaguars. How does, this, how does this impact the other receivers on the Titans and as well as how does it impact Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill? Well, with the way Derrick Henry runs the ball and last season was kind of the first time we've really seen Derrick Henry explode in the NFL outside of that four touchdown game that he had, but no AJ Brown. I really don't see Ryan Tannehill throwing the ball downfield. He's more of just a game manager at this point in his career. Uh, I see, I see them turning into just a run heavy offense, just pound the ball with Derrick Henry. And honestly, with the way Derrick Henry runs and the production that he gets, I won't, I don't see the problem in giving him 40 carries a game. I don't see the problem with giving any running back 40 carries in the game if they are your only feasible way to generate offense. If you're missing your top receiver, you either need everyone else, every receiver on the depth chart to step up, which we have yet to see from the other receivers on the Titans, or you've got to find other ways to get that production. Many ways it's in the running game. As for the Ryan Tannehill part, we all we have to know that last year, that's not who Ryan Tannehill is. <laughs> no. Like that's the definition of catching lightning in a bottle and just riding it similarly to what happened with Nick Foles. Like, 
Brian Tannehill, that's just a level of production and consistency that's just unsustainable on a year to year basis, especially from what we've seen through the other years of his career in Miami. I, I don't agree with paying Ryan Tannehill a long-term contract simply because of the size of that outlier. It makes no sense. It doesn't fall into any form of trajectory in his career. He's not going to be able to keep it up. There will be a regression there. And then if there's a regression at the quarterback spot, there's going to be a regression all around for receivers, simply by virtue of the quarterback's not going to perform as well. The receivers statistically aren't going to perform as well. If you lose your top receiver, that's not going to be a good passing offense. Now, nah, there are Titans. Any advice I'd give them, honestly, is just you run Derrick Henry until he can't, until he's proving that, you know, can't produce for you anymore. But as of right now, I just see the Titans as a run heavy offense and Ryan Tannehill really only throwing the ball on uh, passing situations. That's really all I see from them. Another piece of wide receiver news, Alshon Jeffrey will be out for the Eagles game against the Los Angeles Rams this week. And how does this impact Carson Wentz after he came off a very shaky game against the Washington football team? Carson Wentz, man. Ah. You know, he, he, he's a good quarterback. He's good. He's probably, probably the best quarterback in the division. But last, last week's game was just really, really ugly. You, you just can't go. You just can't get beat the way that they did by the Washington football team. You're up 17, and then your whole offense basically just imploded. You couldn't do anything with the ball. He got sacked eight times. Now, I do see the tight ends Goddard and Ertz um, getting a big jump in production, which they already had last week. Uh, that's they had a touchdown each. Goddard had uh, most of the catches and really was uh, getting most of the targets from Carson Wentz. Uh, I, oh, I seen them coming into this year as more of a tight end heavy team uh, rather than their receivers. Cause Alshon Jeffrey, he's ever since he got to the Eagles, he hasn't been what really we thought he was going to be there. I thought he would have been a lot better off uh, with them rather than with the bears, but turns out that they don't really know how to use him correctly either. And him being down, I just see them giving the ball to Ertz and Goddard all day. This goes back to what we were saying about A.J. Brown and the Jags. When you have a receiver go down, you need to find other ways to get that production. And for the Eagles, that is with their tight ends. Because Ertz and Goddard, they have been, they've both been able to produce very consistently, despite the fact that they're both tight ends. You, most teams, you don't see a lot of – two tight end formations and both of them running in receiver routes and patterns no. with the Eagles. They're finding a way to make it work. And also getting sacked eight times. A lot of that could be attributed to the offensive line because Lane Johnson did not play week one. And, you know, said on the last show, me and Kane, you know, Lane Johnson is playing this week, according to Lane Johnson. Like he said he will be playing, but I don't see how that's going to help them against Aaron Donald because Aaron right. Donald's an interior player. Lane Johnson is a tap. They just aren't going to be going up against each other. No. And Aaron Donald embarrassed the Cowboys offensive line on multiple occasions. And I don't know if the Eagles offensive line will be able to do much better against him. I mean, I'm sure you've seen that video of Aaron Donald just throwing the Cowboys offensive line around. Oh, he just tossed the entire, he just tossed the three interior players. It, it, it's, it's really crazy because you like, you have to be, I, I don't even can't even comprehend how strong you have to be to throw two 300 pound men right off their feet. Yes. And he makes it look so easy too. Oh, he makes it look effortless. It's just insane. It, it really is. So the only way I can really see the Eagles finding a good level of success, is being able to move the pocket and move once around. And also Wentz just has to not shoot himself in the foot because he threw two interceptions against the Washington football team and they were just bad throws, bad decisions. Like it's one thing to say last year, you know, he didn't have the receivers, but he managed to do it. He didn't have the offensive line last week and he didn't manage to do it. There comes a point where I don't give a crap who you are as a quarterback. Yeah. Absolutely. If everything else around you is so bad, you just can't win. It's not basketball where you can just get one great player and he can carry you. 
In football, you need to be at least average everywhere on the team. No, that's exactly right. And well, detour here, but I, it's kind of the same thing with Sam Donald over there and with the Jets. They just surround him with nothing. And I mean, you can't even really get an assessment on the guy because he just has nothing at all times. His offensive line is terrible. Le'Veon Bell can't stay on the field. He has no receivers. I mean, I kind of feel bad for him, but like he, he really can't even get a fair assessment on him. No, you can't because if the talent around a quarterback isn't at least average, then no matter who you put there, he's going to look like crap. And it's not even that Le'Veon Bell can't stay on the field. It's just that Le'Veon Bell isn't good. Yeah, he's not the player he once was in Pittsburgh. No. They, they let Robbie Anderson walk for some reason, who was by far their One best the receiver. Stupidest offseason move, I think. Their, their offensive line is just atrocious. You can say all they want about Mekhi Becton in the draft. He's a rookie. He's unproven. Sam Donald is getting killed. And it's not because of him. It's because everything around him is so bad. He has to try and carry a team. And that's just something you can't expect a quarterback to do. You can't expect a quarterback to carry dog crap to the playoffs. It's just not going to happen. And you know what? It's not going to get any easier for the Jets this season. Coming up, they got to play the San Francisco 49ers. And all I can see is Nick Bosa just wreaking havoc all over that offensive line. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a nightmare. So now we're getting back to Thursday and I recap. Are the Browns finally figuring it out? Because they won, but it was against the Bengals and they won 35 to 30. Listen, I just think that the Browns, they have the talent on paper. It's almost as if you just can't figure out why they aren't good. But Honestly, I just think Baker Mayfield isn't good. I just feel like if the Browns had a better quarterback, they would be doing much, much better. And honestly, I got to see more out of this team than just beating up on the Bengals. I mean, not even beating up. They didn't even beat up on them. They only won by five points. Barely won. They barely scrapped by. To a rookie rookie quarterback, and and the Bengals' defense didn't have Geno Atkins on it. Or Mike Daniels. Their defense was depleted. So that was just – that was just you you guys just barely getting by a bad team. Although, on the bright side, as a Odell fantasy owner, he finally scored a touchdown at 75 yards, a couple catches. So he had a pretty productive fantasy day, which was something I was very – surprised after week one, yeah. One thing I'll say, I wrote this in my preview of the Thursday night game. The Browns, like, their key to victory is – and one of the biggest matchups – one of the biggest matchups was Baker Mayfield versus himself. Like, can he not shoot himself in the foot? Can he not screw something up? They also said, take the ball out of Baker Mayfield's hands and put it in Nick Chubb's. Now, that's somewhat because I wanted Nick Chubb to do it because I haven't fantasy. No. But also, when Nick Chubb is humming, that offense is humming. Like, you can't expect Baker Mayfield to drop back 60-something times – and win you the game. I don't think it's crazy to say that Joe Burrow is a better quarterback than Baker Mayfield because Joe Burrow Not almost true. single-handedly won the Bengals that game despite them being overmatched everywhere. Their offensive line was no match for the Browns' pass rush. A.J. Green isn't great anymore. They lost their tight end for the season. They don't have great running backs. And their defense is absolutely depleted, and yet they almost won. So I'm saying Baker Mayfield – like, is it crazy to say that his rookie year is the best that he will ever become? And that's just been a steady downhill from there because that's certainly what it's looking like right now. It, that's, that, that's what the story is looking to be right now. Uh, he's, see, the thing is, he's just not, he's not a pocket passer. And I feel like the Browns, like, just keep trying to make him that. Like, that, that, that's not what he is. He has to be rolling out of the pocket, on the run, you know, th- scrambling and throwing the ball to whoever he can find on broken plays. But – With the running backs they have in Cleveland, I mean, you have Nick Chubb and you have Kareem Hunt, who also scored in this game. So you got two very good running backs. I don't see why you don't just run a two-headed monster in the backfield and you just become a a run-heavy offense. And then, you know, if you get into situations where you need someone to make a catch, you do have Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham on the outside. 
I, it's really it's really all up to Baker at this point. If he can't succeed this season, uh, I'm thinking the Browns are going to be right back into the quarterback lottery pool. Well, here's the one other part about Baker Mayfield and him wanting to be, you know, outside the pocket, extending plays, all that. I don't think he's a good enough athlete to be able to do that at the NFL level. Like this was one thing that happened to Johnny Manziel and college level, yeah. he could do it, but that's because the average college athlete can't compare or come anywhere near to comparing the average NFL athlete. And I guess the point where you have to say, okay, I can't do this anymore. I need to be able to start playing like a pocket quarterback. I need to start being able to play like a quarterback who can run the script because at this point, I think the Browns kind of just want someone who can be a game manager. Baker Mayfield doesn't want to be that. He wants to run outside the pocket. He wants to play like Russell Wilson, despite not being close to the athlete that Russell Wilson is. No, I'm, see, and Baker, this is my problem I had with him last year, was I see way, way too many commercials of Baker Mayfield, and yet his performance on the field is just so subpar. And it's like, I just, I just don't get it. You, you're doing all this time making all these commercials. You really should be in the gym learning how to, learning how to throw or just stand tall in the pocket. At least I don't know, do something. I mean, all you, all I see from this guy is him making commercials. And he even said, "I'm, I'm not going to make that many commercials this year. I'm going to go into the gym. I'll l- listen to what people told me." And all I've seen, all week one and Thursday night, I counted maybe at least ten commercials from Baker. You can make commercials, you know, after, you know, you've won a Super Bowl. Yeah, exactly. After, you know, you've proven yourself. Not after, like, a rookie year where, yes, you had a great rookie year, but that's just one year. That is one year out of your entire NFL career, regardless of how long that's going to last. You need to be able to prove that you can play consistently. You need to be able to prove that you can bring it every, every day, every week, every practice, every game, every play. And Baker Mayfield just hasn't been doing that. You could say that you could think that there's maybe some complacency there, him thinking, oh, okay, you know, broke the touchdown record for a rookie. Mm-hmm. Nice. Let's go make a bunch of commercials and make money that way. And while it's great for him to, you know, go on out chase and make more money, but I guess to the point where don't you want to become a better quarterback? Because when you become a better quarterback, you get a massive contract. It's not going to be a Mahomes level contract, but you're going to get well compensated for being a good quarterback. And the longer you're a good quarterback, the more commercials you're going to be able to make, the more merchandise you're going to be able to sell. Right. It's like yeah. football needs to come first before commercials because the only reason you're doing commercials is because you're a good football player. All right. And it just seems like Baker doesn't even care about the football aspect at some, at some points. I mean, he just may, uh, to me personally, I can't stand when I see guys making – all these commercials, you know, doing all this like social media stuff when they really haven't done anything yet. And Baker's just, like at the top of that list. <laughs> yeah. Like, would it be crazy to say that, you know, he kind of ate all the chips on his shoulder? That like what drove him was, you know, being a walk on, being disrespected, not being the starter out of the way. And then when he kind of proved that, he just kind of lost the edge. Like when he kind of took over and started, he just kind of lost that edge to him. Yeah, I think so. Uh, he coming out of college, I mean, he was that like scrappy kid that you know earned his spot, and he he sat for a couple games behind uh, Tyrod Taylor, and when he finally made his uh, start and he was able to play, you know, he broke he very well. Broke the Browns broke the Browns losing streak and you know he had a good he had a good season but after that it's you you haven't been doing well since your rookie year that's supposed to be you know you, probably your worst or second to worst year you have in the NFL it's not supposed to be your best no like if your rookie year is your best year there is an issue there very big very big issue there One piece of news that just broke, George Kittle will not be playing against the Jets this weekend. He will miss week two after suffering a knee injury in the season opener. 
how does this affect the 49ers? How does, how does this affect Jimmy Garoppolo? How does it affect other tight ends on the roster? Who is going to be hurt most by the loss of George Kittle? Oof. Wow. Well, as everyone I think knows by now, George Kittle is one of the best, if not the best tight end in the league. So I think if anybody gets hurt by this more, it's going to be Jimmy G who already at this point, you know, doesn't really have any proven receivers. Uh, I can see Brandon Ayuk uh, maybe getting a little more, getting some production as he's going to be making his NFL debut this week, but I can't see Jimmy G trusting him too much with the ball. I will say though that Jordan Reed, I think could potentially have a big game against the Jets, but Uh, As we saw last year from the 49ers, uh, they were a run-heavy team and even the same thing in week one against the Cardinals. Uh, I think they're just going to be running the ball down the Jets' throat this week. We can all agree that George Kittle is the number one option by far on the San Francisco 49ers, correct? Yeah, absolutely. They really don't have anything outside of him. Evo Samuel's on IR. Jalen Hurd is on IR. Tavon Austin's on IR. You can say what you want about those names, but Debo Samuel was expected to take a step. You know, Trey's kind of upset because he's on his fantasy team and now he's on IR. But <laughs> the 49ers starting receivers are going to be Kendrick Bourne, Brandon Ayuk, and Trent Taylor. Now, if they just run the crap out of the ball, that's not really going to matter. Trent Taylor was – one of my who the fuck is that guy picks mainly because the 49ers don't have any depth at receiver and it's starting to show now, you know, I don't know who's going to be the number one option. It has to, at this point, it has to be Brandon Ayuk because Kittle's out. They're playing with a lot of backups on offense. Mm -hmm. It's going to turn into the Raheem Moster, Devin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon show. Like those three running backs are going to have to carry the load of the team because I don't think Jimmy Garoppolo can get it done without a good wide receiver. You can talk about his numbers last year, but he really beat up on the Cardinals when they were bad. Yeah. And most of his good games came from playing the Cardinals last year. Yeah. And at the end of the day, Kyle Shanahan, he's an offensive genius. And he's going to be looking to run the ball up this week because there's going to be no other pass catchers for the 49ers that are going to be active. Yeah. No, uh, Jimmy G Sometimes, sometimes I got to feel I got to feel for the guy because they just have not been able to surround him with receivers outside of Kittle and Emmanuel Sanders last year, and then even at that they let Emmanuel Sanders leave. And I mean, all right, you draft I Brandon Ayuk, but you already had receiver concerns. Now you got even more uh, receiving options going down. I it, it just seems like the 49ers are. Uh, just really trying to make Jimmy G be a game manager and just run the ball heavy. Absolutely. How do you think Kyle Shannon's going to split the carries? Do you think it's going to be an even split? Do you think we just got to wait to see who plays well out of the game and he's just going to stick with him? Or do we have no idea what the hell Shannon's going to do? Because it seems like he just kind of gives the ball to whoever he wants and they produce. Uh, I can tell you last year I was Tevin Coleman fantasy owner and I had him for that, like, two weeks where he just absolutely exploded and he just couldn't help but be so frustrated that the the workload just kept switching between Brita, uh, Coleman, and Mosert, and it just kept doing that all year long. So it's really – honestly, I have no idea who Shanahan's going to give the ball to. Um, I will tell you this. He'll probably start out with giving it to Mozart, um, but if Mozart uh, doesn't got it within maybe the first two series, it's gonna go to it's gonna go to McKinnon. It'll go to Coleman. I think whoever whoever Shanahan thinks is gonna be uh, his best option that day is gonna be the one that'll get the bulk of the carries. Absolutely, and we're just gonna wrap this up with one more piece of injury news. Chris Godwin is still in concussion protocol and is doubtful for this weekend. How does this affect a Buccaneers offense that seemed to really struggle against New Orleans Saints? Yeah. Well, I would say you'd have to hope that uh, Mike Evans and Tom Brady can 
get more on the same page coming this week. It was pretty big disappointment last week, I think. But, you know, honestly, you know, Tom Brady, you come into a new team, you had all the COVID protocols in, so they couldn't get a lot of work in. And now your number two receiver is down. Uh, I just see him, he's really going to have to try to rely on Mike Evans here. Or maybe maybe Gronk could uh, <laughs> see the field a little more. But who knows what shape he's going to be in. Uh, I just think the Bucks are not looking too great at the moment, although they do get to play the Carolina Panthers, who uh, last week really, really dropped the ball in that Raiders game. Here's the one thing I'll say, like, about Gronk returning, like, we know he was not just, like, in the gym 24-7 when he was retiring, right? He was, he, he was in WWE winning the 24-7 title. <laughs> yeah, like, he's just this guy who, you know, we've seen what he does when he's not playing football. Like, can we really expect him to be working out when he just retired? Yeah. And also one more thing with the Godwin injury is that I feel this gives Scotty Miller a great shot to shine. Because in that Saints game, Scotty Miller had the same amount of fantasy points as Chris Godwin did in a standard league. See, like that's Scotty crazy. Miller and Chris Godwin had the same amount of yards in that game. And so with Chris Godwin being ruled out, it moves Scotty Miller up the depth chart automatically to where he's either going to 100% be the slot guy or he's going to split out wide for however many snaps there is. And Brady was looking Miller's way quite a bit in that Saints game. Now you can say what you want about Brady being shot and all that. And so I'd say, I'd agree with you. Yeah. And I'd also say that another big reason for his decline in play was going from a somewhat stable offensive line in new England to an offensive line in Tampa Bay. That's playing teams with very good pass rushers in the new Orleans Saints. They have a great defense, the Carolina Panthers, they, they have a good defense. Like, you can say all you want about them struggling last year. You, that was mainly because of the quarterback play. They have good defense. Brian Burns entering his second year. Yutir Gross Matos is out for this game, but they have a great defense in the Carolina Panthers, and you're not going to be able to beat up on the dysfunctional Jets, the Bills, who are starting to figure things out, or the yeah. Dolphins, who seem to be looking in the right direction. You're not in a cupcake division. And so with a declining physical skill set in Tom Brady, having to learn a new offense for the first time in 20 years, and at the end of the day, just there's no familiarity. I didn't think he was going to be great this year. You know, we had, we had a running bet, or I think there was a bet between Trey and Adam about if Brady will be a top five fantasy quarterback. And if you only watch the first drive over that Saints game, you'd be like, oh, it yeah. was the weapons. You know, it was the people around Brady. It was all this. And then, you know, Adam's making all this point in Slack, and I'm like, look, it's one drive. Relax. Next couple drives, you know, there's the pick. There's the pick six. Yeah. Nothing. Like, you can't base your opinion on someone off of one drive. I typically don't like to do it after one game because, again, anyone can have a great game beating up the Bengals and come around and have an absolutely atrocious game playing against the Patriots. Of course. But that game did not look great for Tom Brady because if the game would have been so much closer because, you know, you talk about it and it's like, oh, well, you know, defense didn't do him any favors. The Saints scored 34 points. Well, seven of those were from a pick six. And then the other Brady interception gave the Saints a short field. When yeah. you have older quarterbacks, you need to force them to have to travel a field because Drew Brees isn't great either. Like, no, nah, he, he averaged he, he right around that. five yards per attempt, maybe even less. And he averaged between two and three yards, air yards per completion. Like, he's just, like, he's just not throwing deep. No. He can't, he won't. And it's come to the point where he's realized that, you know, he can't, and he's not going to do it. He's just going to rely on the short game. And that's great and all, but that's not going to be able to carry you into the playoffs. No, and on the other side with uh, the Saints, pretty this pretty much – this is going to – I think – I honestly think this is Drew Brees last year, or at least his 
last year of being a decent quarterback in the NFL. Uh, he just didn't look like the Drew Brees of old in that game. And that game was totally won by the defense. And when at almost any point in the past, could you say the Saints won games just because of their defense and not because of Drew Brees? Yeah, it's it's just looking it's just looking like Drew Brees is uh, going to be on his way out soon. But even with – and then back to Tom Brady, you know, on that pick six play, uh, when Bruce Arians uh, ripped him in the media post game for that, uh, you know, that play was a screen to where he threw to the backside. And, I mean, if he – it just to me looks like that he doesn't even have trust in his team yet. And – I don't know. I feel like when you're that old of a quarterback, I mean, you kind of just have to trust your team and whether they fail you or they lift you up, you're going to have to live and die with what they do. And you kind of just have to take what you can get there. Well, here's the thing. Like he has to live and die by what the team does. Like it doesn't matter if you trust them or not. He's completely dependent on them. Yeah. Like you can't get it done by yourself in football. So do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, game to watch, player to watch, something? Uh, yeah, one one game. Green Bay Packers against the Detroit Lions. Desmond Trufant's out. No Justin Coleman. Um, they got Jeff Okuda making his NFL debut, and it looks like he's going to have to take majority of Devontae Adams that game. So I'm thinking Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers are going to rip this Lions defense part. And it's just not going to be a pretty weekend for the, the Detroit Lions. Aaron Rodgers, that week against the Vikings, I wrote about this. He looked like he was just playing pissed off. He, yeah, he really – yeah, Aaron Rodgers, I, I, I thought he was done. I'm not going to lie. I really thought Aaron Rodgers after – like last season, to me, the Packers were masquerading as 13-3 and team. They just had – they kind of had a soft schedule, and he – really wasn't producing that well. And I, and I mean, the Packers look like they gave up on him. They used their first round pick on a, on a quarterback. That's just blatant disrespect to Aaron Rodgers. but he came out and just looked like, you know, I'm still Aaron Rodgers. I'm still one of the best quarterbacks in this league and against the team that I normally don't do well against. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to absolutely destroy them. And that's exactly what he did. I feel like with Aaron Rodgers, he just needed that one push. Because yeah. do you think it's crazy to say that ever since, you know, he had the reputation of winning the Super Bowl, being just the guy in 2014, do you think it's crazy to say that he somewhat was just coasting a little bit because he didn't really have anything to push him or piss him off? I think it's fair to say. I mean, what would he need the second Super Bowl ring for? Yeah, other than just like a personal gain. I Everywhere, I mean, Aaron Rodgers was – still the best best in the league, breaking records, you know, every season. It was like season in, season out. He's throwing 5,000 yards. So, I mean, the second Super Bowl to, to him probably didn't really mean that much. So he kind of was just, you know, I'm still good. I really don't have to practice that much. Or, you know, I could just step on the field and will my team to win. But uh, first time, I think, in a long time, Aaron Rodgers looks like he's got a little chip on his shoulder and – all I'll say is uh, the league better watch out for a pissed off Aaron Rodgers. Pissed off Aaron Rodgers. If he can keep producing like he did in week one, it's going to be a scary sight for the NFC. Yeah, I think so. All right. So thank you all for watching. Check out the website, vendettasportsmedia.com. Check out the shop, buy a shirt, buy something, buy some merchandise. I believe some new stuff will be on the way soon. So stay tuned for that. And until next time, thank you.